Hey everyone, the name is Eric Dorn. In today's video, we will be discussing eight alchemical rules that you can use to understand the base structure of your human mind and of your conscious worldview. So first of all, before we get started, alchemy is a general practice, a methodology you can use to navigate and understand any science. Many sciences were born as a result of alchemical input, so alchemy has been a really valuable historical tool, and you can use it just as well to understand psychology and the human mind. What's more is actually, Carl Jung used alchemy in order to develop his base structure of the self and his idea and concept of the cognitive function. So, Alchemy has been super valuable and you can use it yourself to understand yourself and other people. Now what are the 8 alchemical rules that you can use to understand the orientation and structure of the human mind? Well, first, rule number one. For the self to exist, there needs to be a world or a narrative in which the self operates. However, we tend to be largely unconscious of what that paradigm or what that general narrative is. In the beginning, we are only conscious of the fact that we have a self, a general way of experiencing the world and the way that we think is good. <laughs> and so that is our general concept of self. That everything that exists is understood by its purpose and role for the self. And that's the only reason why it exists and that's the only purpose for it to exist. Rule number two is that if there is a self, that suggests that there is also an anti-self. That means as we grow more conscious, we recognize that we have a self or things that we identify with and things that we do not identify with. We recognize, for example, that there is an outer world or that th there are parents or people that exist in our life that are not us. And that's a strange experience. The fact that there is an oppositional force in our life, an oppositional self or something that goes against what we want, some other will that is manifesting itself in our conscious sphere. And so before we understand that, when this is unconscious, anything that is not or does not pertain to the self is seen as strange or weird or unexplainable or it is completely ignored. Rule number three is, if there is a self and an anti-self, there must also be supporting or intermediary entities that exist that carry properties of the self and of the anti-self. For example, our parents might serve as a kind of uh, grounding or intermediary force between us and what is not us. So our parents can help us navigate life and our existence. Our, uh, siblings and people around us somehow exist in a vacuum between anti-self and self. They have some properties that are not us and they have some properties that are us and we can use uh, them to serve the self. So we engage in and create an auxiliary or tertiary aspect of ourselves that is placed in a relationship to the self and the anti-self. So you can imagine a circle like that with a pole in the top is the self then you have the supporting self, the auxiliary, then you have on the other side, the oppositional to that, you have the tertiary self, or you could say the regressive self, and finally in the bottom you have the anti-self. And these two carry qualities of both of these two, but they carry different or oppositional qualities to one another. So that's how you can understand their relationship. Now, uh, we tend to look at the anti-self as evil and the self as good. However, is that really true? Rule number four. If the world and paradigm in which the self operates has multiple parts, there must be an established relationship between these parts and these parts must all have their distinct attitudes and purpose inside the general scope of the psyche. That means the self and anti-self, the uh, auxiliary and the tertiary are and with development and maturity all understood to have a purpose. There are good things about the anti-self, there are good things about the self, there are good things about the supportive self, and there are good things about the tertiary. We learn that everything has its purpose and function. We can use each function depending on which situation we are in. And we can understand that we can use even the anti-self to accomplish certain goals. With this comes the integration of self. That means when you come to this point, you've hit the point where you understand that you are both the good and the things that you identify with and the opposition. You have nothing that you cannot do. You can do anything. You can use any function and you are not limited to any one of these functions. In fact, you must make sure that they all coexist because 
With practice, you're going to learn that the more single-mindedly you pursue one particular aspect of the self, the more you're going to drive the collapse and disintegration of the self. So you have to continuously balance all these sides and include them in your decision making. You have to be conscious of both of who you are and what you identify with, and you have to understand the limitations and boundaries and things that you lack. You have to understand that you have strengths and you have flaws. You have to understand that you have a supportive self that you can rely on to accomplish things and to better yourself. And you have to learn that you have a tertiary self, a regressive instinct that you are going to follow into on low and dark days. And that this relief, uh, this regressive self can bring relief and stimulation so you can help recharge your batteries. You learn that if you continuously are constantly working to achieve something, you're going to crash and you're going to hit a point where you uh, basically regress to a weaker or more infantile stage of your version of yourself. So you learn that you have to balance all these parts and you learn that all these parts exist and must coexist and all have different functions. Now that brings us to rule number five. With maturity we reach a kind of awakening or a second self because we recognize that while we have our distinction of what the self is and what the anti-self is, other people have a different distinction. Our parents live in a world in which they are the hero and it's where you are and serve a different role. So while you for yourself serve the role of the self, they serve the role of themselves for themselves and you serve to them the role of a kid or a child and so you have a different purpose to them than the purpose that you have for yourself. This is an interesting one and actually this is a difficult one to grasp so before we even begin to grasp these relationships we have to and this is rule number five, form a meta-narrative which can explain why different people act differently. So with this, we give birth to ideology. So ideology is something that comes about when we recognize that um, there are different narratives in the play. We can't understand what these narratives are and we have no idea why people are behaving so irrationally. But the narrative, the goal of the first narrative, the meta-narrative, is to explain why people are behaving irrationally. So we come up with all these explanations. For example, a socialist would say that the reason why uh, people are acting irrationally or in a way that is different to your per personal narrative is because they are selfish or greedy. Or a feminist might say because people are sexist. Or a capitalist might say because uh, people are jealous or envious. So everyone has these different explanations for why people are behaving and living in a way that is irrational to the self. However, we have no understanding of the purpose or use or why people live in these ways. Creating the existence of a narrative naturally, and this is uh, law number six, leads to the creation of an opposing narrative. So socialism will never exist on its own. It will always exist with its antithesis, capitalism. And these two will always be in a state of opposition to one another. Uh, the more you go towards socialism, the more you endanger and threaten uh, people that are on the side of capitalism. And that's what's given rise to that conflict that we've seen in the 20th century. So now something interesting started happening in the 90s and that was uh, the rise of alternative narratives. So alongside these two uh, narratives, the socialist and the capitalist, and this is law number seven, if there is an, uh, a narrative that is positive and oppositional narrative, there are also intermediary narratives. And for example, the green narrative, sustainability and so on might be a kind of narrative such as this, or freedom or liberalism might be a kind of mid intermediary narrative. Similarly, the rise, recent wave or rise into uh, racism or other nationalist movements might also be a compensating narrative. Now, generally, these narratives are understood by their general relationship to your dominant narrative. So if you are a socialist, these two different narratives are regarded as uh, useful only to the extent in which they can be used to support your general narrative. So, uh, for example, a liberal might or a capitalist might be 
swayed to use racist narratives or nationalist narratives to protect or explain why capitalism is failing to achieve certain goals. So if capitalism is having certain struggles or there are uprisings or tensions, an explanation might be immigration. Uh, or if a capitalist goes to a green narrative, they might say a reason why is because of uh, unfair resource distribution or of uh, uh, some kind of um, liberal explanation. So people are not educated enough or people need better schooling or so on and so forth. So these narratives can support your dominant story. But you have to understand that other people might believe that their narrative is the dominant one. So nationalists might see nationalism as the key explanation for how society should be organized, while other people uh, like liberals might see liberalism as the explanation. And that brings us to uh, rule number eight. There is a relationship between all these narratives and all these narratives serve a purpose. The national state has served a purpose in uh, creating accountability and in creating democratic institutions and in creating and ensuring cooperation between different people. Similarly to how liberalism, schooling and free thinking has led to other advantages. Understand that every single aspect and everything we do has a function and a purpose and understand that no single ideology is in itself wrong or bad or uh, needs to be eradicated. We have no need to get rid of all opposing narratives. In fact, a single-minded desire to pursue your own narrative or ideology above all others can lead to the collapse of your society. In fact, the more you go towards the left, the more of a police state you tend to create because you need a kind of fascism to uh, mandate and to uh, ensure that your socialist utopia remains. And that makes it not really a socialist utopia. Uh, the freedom of the workers becomes the slavery of the workers to ensure the stability of the socialist state. Similarly, if the society goes more to the right or towards capitalism, you'll see eventually a collapse of that very capitalist society because that capitalist society suddenly has to invest in police uh, uh, rule and in uh, copyright laws and all forms of authoritarian measures to protect ownership and to protect the rich. And that's the general problem which we find ourselves in. Everyone is so convinced of their own narrative being the only right one and people are struggling to entertain or understand other notions. So rule number eight and the mastery of rule number eight means the ability to move between narratives. What you want to reach is a state of or a holistic state of thinking, which is every narrative serves its purpose. So which narrative is most useful in which situation? How can we apply a capitalist narrative to build a healthy school system? Or how can we use a socialist narrative to improve our school system? If you can learn to be flexible and to switch between different narratives and to learn from and to use their ideas and their possibilities, you can learn how to improve your society. And if you can learn to, uh, for example, apply capitalist thinking in order to drive competition, in order to get more educated teachers, well, that's great. And if you can give and motivate people and uh, students to uh, get higher grades and to uh, get better results through competition, well, that's great. But if you can also ensure and use socialist practices to help people who are struggling to get back up, that's also great. So if you can learn to find a smart way to use all these different ideas in a creative way, you can create a sustainable society. But if you single-mindedly focus on one, you're probably going to eventually hit a wall. Now, these are the eight rules of how the psyche is constructed and the last four rules have a little bit more to do with how the world is constructed but how are they connected well actually everything you experience is an extension of yourself yourself is not just who you are and your own thoughts but it's also your conscious experience of the world everything you see and experience everything you understand is understood from your own lens and how you see the world and how the world relates to you you understand people by their relationship to you. A good person is the person that is good to you. So understand this. Understand that your narrative and story can explain some aspects of life, but not all aspects of life. And understand that 
how you see the world is actually more a reflection of your general well-being and your psychology. Actually, most political intrigues and conflicts can be explained by our general psychology, our personal past traumas and struggles, our viewpoints, our cognitive makeup and how we think and how, uh, what intentions we live by and how we rate and organize our general psyche and how we structure the mind. So before you want to understand politics, you should probably try to understand yourself. Or you're probably going to see yourself falling in the grip of or being manipulated by political movements that prey on your trauma or your insecurities in order to get you to join their movement. Now, ultimately, we all want to become empowered people. We want to have full understanding of ourselves and others. And we want to have a conscious understanding of everything and everything that makes out us. Both the parts that we like and the parts that bring us stress. Both the parts that we aspire to be and the parts that we wish that we didn't have but that we sometimes fall ourselves in the grip of. And all of these things are necessary and not of the, none of this deserves hate or ridicule or anger or resentment. It's all just you experiencing the life. Meaning, as an angle, what you derive as meaningful is your personal view, your personal lens and your personal values. Everyone has a different angle, everyone is a different individual, and everyone has a different psyche. Alchemy is the most powerful tool you can use to understand the psyche, so I really recommend looking into it, and I recommend starting with, for example, Carl Jung's book, Ion, or a Psychological Type, to understand the cognitive structure of the mind. And I also recommend looking at and thinking about postmodernism and looking into Jordan Peterson's works and similar to understand the greater overarching structure of all of these <laughs> narratives and ideologies. Thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you all in the next video.